This talk's mainly about the tendons in your body. We've mentioned it a little bit with the, the stretching and the foam roller stuff, but um, tendons can be really problematic. Um, I, I think most people will have suffered from a tendonitis or, or some form of tendon problem. And what I'm hoping to do is make sure that we can't prevent them fully, but, but that you understand them, that you can help yourself and you can help your coaches and your coaches can help you. You can seek treatment when you need it, if you need it. You don't always necessarily have to go for some treatment. Um, but hopefully we can clear up all this so that you fully understand your body, what it's going through, and why your tendons can become problematic. Okay? So, my day job really for, for the last 20 years has been as a, a lower limb specialist physio at Fazakali Hospital in Liverpool. Uh, and as part of that now I work just in the fracture clinic just as, a, as an orthopaedic doctor basically, just assessing patients referring for scans, operations, etc, etc. And, and most of my working week is foot and ankle, and particularly heel pain takes a massive amount of my time, whether that's plantar fascia, Achilles, Achilles ruptures, and, and, and anything kind of around that. Probably about 80% of my, my week is foot and ankle, about 20% around the knee, uh, and we don't see that many hip conditions per se, apart from arthritis, so I don't get too involved in hips, but that's, that's my working week and has been for, well, that structure for about 10 years now. So we see a lot of this, not typically in guys like yourselves, uh, although we see a lot of tendonitis as being an overuse, maybe running injury or sporting injury. In the majority of people, they are getting it because of habitual problems, things they repeat day after day after day, but not sporting things. So tendonitis can occur in anybody, okay? Now, the reason I think it's important is because for you guys, if you're injured, you're not training, you're still checking out social media, all your mates are still on Strava, clocking out the mileage, setting PBs, KOMs, and we get, unfortunately, like this little red fella in the middle. And, and I don't want you to be there. I've been there, we'll all end up there at some point. I think, again, we're not gonna be perfect, but if we can make sure that we've got a much higher likelihood of us being the yellow fellas, then everybody's gonna be a lot happier, okay? now. You need to avoid this fella, okay? He's never been to university. He's never qualified, as far as I'm aware, from any university. Don't think he went to med school. But yeah, we all give him a lot of credence. We, we, we want to help ourselves. We search, we check. Most of my patients come in with stuff they've printed off and they've, oh, such and such says this. Some of it's good, but this fella can't choose between the quality of the information that he's looking at. So he's going to give you everything. And you won't know necessarily, well, which, which do I look at? And some of the stuff on there is very ignorant and it's very biased. <coughs> so we have to be very, very careful. But hopefully, we need to give you the information that you can make the right decisions, okay? Let's not believe everything we read on the internet, but hopefully, by going through this today, you won't need to. Throughout the talk, I'll, I'll mention tendonitis. Some smart asses said, well, in tendonitis there isn't much inflammation, so it shouldn't have the end in itis, so we'll call it tendinosis, which suggests it's more of a degenerative, like arthritis -y type picture. But it's all semantics, it doesn't really matter. Most of the time we just use the word tendonitis because that's what lay people would, would understand. But really, for, from a medical point of view, we, we now prefer the term tendinopathy, which says there's a pathology of the tendon, and it's quite vague, but, but that's the, 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 the um, parlance that we use mostly. Now I might use jargon through this. If you don't understand anything, feel free to put your hand up. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it and we'll, we'll move on once you've, once you've understood. And then um, hopefully, you know, if we uh, get through it all, then you can ask any sort of detailed questions or if anybody's got any specific questions. I haven't gone into specifics to a great deal because each condition on its own could be talked about for a whole day. So um, we'll keep it quite broad. But by all means, ask me at the end. So, let's get you moving a little bit. This isn't going to be one of them stupid get involved things. But um, stand up for me if you've had one of them. <coughs> okay. So we've got most people up, okay? You might not admit to this, but if your BMI is over 25, which is only the upper end of normal, stand up again. If you're unfortunate to be a lady who is going through the change, you could stand up. Again, I won't look up. If your cholesterol is high or you're on statin medication, you should be stood up again. And if you do any sort of 
endurance sport, and that would capture everybody, then we all need to stand up. And that's because you are much more likely to develop a tendonitis if you fit any of those categories. The biggest predictor of getting a tendon problem is having had it already. Yeah, it makes sense. It heals, but it perhaps doesn't heal perfectly. You've still got some issues that are promoting your body to get a tendonitis, so it, it can come back again in the future. So again, but we'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end, but it's, it's very common in our group of people. Okay. So for us here, it's highly probable that you will get it somewhere at some point in time if you've not had it already. It's the biggest cause, I would say, of inconsistent training. And we know that if we can be consistent, we'll go places. If we follow the plan and we follow it religiously, we'll get where we want to get. But apart from our motivation perhaps coming and going, we're generally pretty well motivated people. That's why you're all sat here. But the thing that's going to piss you off and get in the way is injury. Okay? So we need to try to do what we can to prevent it as much as possible and listen to our bodies as well. And you often, you know, a lot of people in your circumstances will go to a doctor, will go to a physio, and they might just not understand where you're coming from. What do you mean you need to run 20 miles at the weekend? What do you mean you've got a 100 mile bike ride to do? Just stop doing it and you'll be fine. That doesn't suit us, does it? It's the worst thing that anybody can say. But unfortunately, a lot of your medical professionals are not tuned into what we need. Some will be, and if you find one, keep hold of them, because they'll be very useful for you. But if you've not got that, Again, hopefully you'll learn from today's talk and you'll be able to help yourself a little bit before you need to rely on the health professionals. As far as your legs go, the most common sites to get a tendinopathy are the four top ones in black, uh, in, the, in the darker print. So it's your Achilles, it's your plantar fascia, it's your gluteal tendons on the outer side of your hip, and it's your patella tendon just below the kneecap. So that accounts for the majority of the tendonitis that we, that we would come across. The other um, injuries in the lower limb is the proximal hamstring origin, so that's just where your sit bone is, up right at the top of the hamstring where it joins your, your uh, pelvis. You've got your IT band down the side of the leg, you've got your tib post, which is a muscle down the inside of your shin that comes to the inside of your foot, and that one's really important for holding the arch of your foot, so that one can become a problem with, with running particularly. And the perineal muscles are the ones down the outer side of the ankle, so kind of the opposite side. They can be injured when you sprain your ankle, they can be overused with some swimming things and with some running things as well. So they're the, the things that we see the most, but the top four account for most of my working week generally. <laughs> and even the patella side of it is quite rare. So the top three really is pretty much yeah, most of my week so taken into account there. Now, there's two of those with the IT band and the plantar fascia. They're not strictly tendons, they are fascia. But for our purposes, fascia and tendons, same thing. They join muscles to bones and they hold everything together and it's connective tissue that's not muscle. So fascia, tendons, same thing, okay? If we look into it just a little bit, I, I'm not gonna overdo the sciencey side, but you've got small, very, sorry, very small collagen myofibers. They're grouped together into fascicles. Fascicles are grouped together by more connective tissue. And essentially, you've got your tendon, which is kind of bright white and glistening, so it can slide through between the different fascia within your body and against the bones and the joints. So that's what a tendon looks like. But for most patients, I don't really try and describe it like that. If they've got kids, they'll understand cheese strings. And that's essentially what a tendon is. It's a cheese string, OK? Now, if you go into it a little bit more detail, the, the, the most of the science that you need to know is you've got cells, and the cells are called tenocytes. Okay, so teno for tendon, site is a cell, so it's a tendon cell. Now that is the key. That's the key for things going wrong, that's the key for things getting better. The collagen is the main constituent of the tendon apart from water. Um, and collagen is the bit that we tend to focus on, it's the bit that we see go wrong. When we scan people, we see that. But it's not the be all and end all and it's not the key point to, to a tendon problem. So I'll, I'll come back to that. The reason that tendon problems are very, very problematic is that tendons don't have a great blood supply. Okay, they're largely anaerobic. They're a rope of fixed length, fairly enough. They, they stretch a tiny bit, but they're essentially a fixed rope. So they don't need oxygen. They don't need metabolism because they don't actually do anything other than transmit a force from a muscle to a bone. The problem is if they go wrong, if you've not got a great blood supply, you don't heal that quick. Okay, so lots of muscle tears, if you've tore your calf muscle, etc., it goes black and blue and it's bloody painful, but generally six to eight weeks, you're on the, you're on the road to recovery. That never happens with a tendonitis. It never gets better that quick. And if it does, 
maybe it wasn't that to start with, to be honest. Okay, so that's that's the bit that we're getting at. And then the process by which your tendon either gets worse or gets better is called mechanotransduction. So the tendon cell is sensitive to what you do to it, so what strain you put it under. And it's that control of that tendon cell and either resting it or provoking it that gets you better or worse. And that's, that's what I'd like you to take away, if anything, just from the, the sciencey background. Now the thing that makes our lower limb tendons a bit different to our upper limb tendons is energy storage. For locomotion, we need them to help us reduce the energy needed to, to run or to walk. So they store up energy. So as you say you're running or you're walking and you load that Achilles tendon, that resistance to stretch stores that energy and then it releases it. And that, that storage and release of energy makes your running more economical. Even if you're not an economical runner, it really does help the economy of running, okay? So that's, that's the main function. Tendons, again, contrary to what people think, tendons need to be stiff. We don't want stretchy tendons. If something's stretchy, it elongates, it doesn't store energy, and then it doesn't release much energy. We want a stiff spring that we can land on and push off. Okay, now most of this is obviously sort of more around running. Um, because that's the exercise, as it says at the bottom there, stretch shortening cycle. That's what we do when we run. We stretch it by landing on it, <coughs> and then it shortens as it releases that um, energy. Cycling doesn't really do it so much, and certainly swimming doesn't really do it. But that's why running has the highest injury risk. For that exact reason, okay? Now... This is the model that, in healthcare, we use to, to govern um, tendinopathy. And again, keep it dead brief. If we're on the right-hand side, the green bit over here, this is us loading the tendon. It's reacting to that. It's getting itself stronger. It's happy with it. It's a nice, slow process, and we're, we're getting along absolutely fine. We're breaking the tendon down a little bit, but it's always recovering, and it's getting better, and we're getting probably a stronger tendon and a stiffer tendon. If we start to either overload it, or underload it, changes will occur. And this is what we need to avoid. If it's excessive overload or excessive underloading, then that tendon will change its structure because your body's constantly adapting. And that's when we could run into problems. So that's it in simplistic terms. The other thing that it's showing you is that a tendon goes from normal to reactive. So the first thing you might see is your tendon looks sore, obviously it will look this sore, and, and looks swollen. Now at first, that is simply the tendon sucking in water to protect itself. It's not inflammation, and that's where this itis osteopathy ending came from. We, we, we think of it as inflammation because it looks swollen and we've just hurt ourselves, so it must be inflamed. But in the majority of cases, it's purely the tendon sucking in water to distribute load within itself better, and it swells. Now you see that very commonly with the Achilles. If you've got a problem with the mid portion of your Achilles, it will be swollen down both sides like a, a little football in, in, around the middle of the tendon. If you let that, so if you don't react to that, you don't make changes, it would then move on to tendon disrepair where the collagen fibres actually become damaged. Now, those two are still reversible. If you get to tendinopathy that's degenerative, where you might feel little hard nodules within the tendon, where it's probably been there for a long, long time, that is irreversible. Now, I'm not saying you can't get rid of the pain, but you can't get the tendon back to normal. It's gone that far that that tendon will always be irregular and always be degenerative. If we can stop it before that, obviously that is then reversible, so we could end up with a much more healthy, normal-looking collagen tendon, okay? So, we're able to scan it. There's relatively recent, uh, well, yeah, it's fairly recent. We can take an ultrasound scanner, and we can scan, this is an Achilles, we can scan an Achilles tendon, and depending on how strong that signal is coming back from the ultrasound machine, it will give us a colour as to the quality of the collagen. So if collagen is nice and tight and taut and it's all aligned nice and parallel, it will give us a strong beam back from the ultrasound, so we get a green. If it's a little bit wavy and it's not really as taut as it should be, it's a little bit irregular, we get blue. And then if it's totally damaged and there's a lot of water content rather than collagen content, it becomes red. So it's like a simple sort of traffic light sort of system. So on the top one is your normal tendon. It's quite small and it's mainly green because all that collagen's working well. 
As we come to the reactive one, this is that second stage where it's a little bit swollen. You can see it's still mostly green, and it, but it's, it's bigger, it's, it's much more swollen. And then as we move on, we get more red, and obviously red is not great. Red's never great as far as this is concerned. Is that reasonably okay? I've not confused anybody too much with that. So everybody wants to know, well, why is it me? You know, what, you know, what, what is it about me? Why do I keep getting injured? Blah, blah, blah. Now, there's, there's, there's numerous reasons. This next couple of slides are the main risk factors, okay? So the main risk factors for you to get a tendonitis is you might just be genetically susceptible to it. Certain genes have been identified that help your tendons to repair themselves. And if you don't have those, those combinations of genes, you're probably more likely to get a problem with your tendons. And at the moment, because we're not doing much genetic modification of ourselves, that's something we kind of have to accept. But if you're somebody who regularly gets tendon issues, we probably need to be making changes to your program because that's likely to continue. So we need to realize that and maybe make some changes, okay? And I'll kind of go on to what the changes could be a little bit later. As you get older, that tenocyte, that tendon cell that controls everything, it just slows down. You provoke it from a hard running session and it doesn't react the same way as it used to, which is kind of the, you know, the sort of thing of aging, isn't it? These, these things happen. So what it might be with an aging athlete is they can still do the hard training, but they may need extra recovery to give that tendon cell time to rebuild the collagen before you go again. So it's not that you can't train hard, unfortunately, uh, but, but you need to get more recovery in all likelihood. Now, for the recovery period, the peak degradation, so, so the time that tendon collagen is most depleted after, a, say, a run session is about 36 hours. The time that it's maximally restoring itself is 72 hours. So that means you certainly want to, wouldn't really, in an ideal world, want to do many back-to-back -back hard run days. If you're well-conditioned, maybe you're a lighter athlete, you might be able to run most days, but they can't afford to be all top end, okay? And as a, as a rough ballpark, it needs to at least be every other day, if not every fourth sort of day would be much, much safer, particularly if you're an aging athlete or you've got genetic susceptibility. These are the things that we need to be, be thinking about. Again, we said about obesity and this sort of side. If you're bigger, you're more likely to get a tendonitis, okay? But interestingly, it's not because you're bigger. It's not just more weight. It's the chemical and the biological changes that go on in your body. So certainly if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, higher likelihood. If you're not controlling those blood sugars well, you're more likely to get tendinopathy. Um, the adipose tissue and the, the lipids, they actually promote more of an acidic nature to the, to the body. So acidic, uh, sorry, acidic environments are more prone to become problematic, whereas alkaline environments are more likely to be, to be healthy. So there's definitely something around that, but it's not as simple as just being big. You know, if you're big and muscly, you're probably at no more risk of, uh, of, of uh, tendinopathy. Again, there's a couple of measurements that you can take in there. We know that certainly from my working week, the majority of my patients with tendinopathy are middle-aged ladies who work on their feet all day, who are overweight and going through the menopause. That is, apart from athletic sort of populations like yourselves, that's my biggest subgroup of, of patients for these problems. And the menopausal side of it is <clears throat> tendons have estrogen receptors on them, and estrogen is thought to help to nourish and keep the tendon fairly healthy. But obviously as you go through the menopause, you start to produce less estrogen, and that can be an issue, um, which is again an issue for a lot of the problems that ladies go through at that point in their life. The, again, I've never gone to the point of putting somebody on HRT or actually suggesting they take an estrogen supplement for a tendon problem because it's kind of way over the top for the other health implications versus the, the, the issue of a tendonitis because tendonitis might really bug the hell out of us, but it will never do us any long-term damage or harm really. So there's, there's, stuff, there's, there's work still to be done about that, but as I say, from, a, from my point of view in the NHS, I see a hell of a lot of that. Again, if you're menopausal, postmenopausal, perimenopausal lady, Involved in triathlon, that needs to be taken into account. Might not need major changes, but there will be a biological consequence within your body from that time of your life, and we need to we need to work alongside that if possible. And then previous injury. So previous injury, as I said before, if you've had it before, don't bury your head in the sand. You're more likely to get it coming back again, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's the, the stuff that we're more interested in is the training factors. So the things we're training that we're likely to find cause us injury of the tendons is just too much running because it's much more likely to cause tendinopathy just because of that stretching and shortening under load with gravity that we don't get with cycling and with swimming. If we have insufficient recovery, as I said before, our inflammatory markers are raised a little, our collagen's not really sort of healed itself, and if we go again and again and again, then we're going to get problems in all likelihood. That happens obviously with uh, people who get into these boom-bust cycles, so they, 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 they get really motivated, they've signed up for a race, they get stuck in, they're doing extra sessions, blah, 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 and then shortly after they get injured. Or somebody who's come from a layoff period, and they've had a long time off, and then they hit it really hard because they've had too much time off and they've got weight to lose and blah, 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 and they get stuck in, and that's more likely to come on again because they've unloaded the tendon for a period of time and it's got used to being lazy. So that's, that's the, the difficulties that we've got there. Um, and then any areas of, we've been talking with the, with the foam roller and stuff, if you've got areas of restriction, a lot of the time you won't feel a problem with the muscle that's tight. It's just the imbalance that it causes, and the problem will pop up somewhere else. So, again, if you're doing a physio or whatever, you're looking at people a little bit more globally. Where have you got tightness? How do they run? Et cetera, et cetera. And we can look into the biomechanics to see if there's an area that we really need to work on that might be a little bit further away from the site of pain. Uh, so that's, again, that's partly what I, I deal with. So how do you know if you've got tendonitis? It's quite simple, really. It is a fairly easy diagnosis to make in most people. They get pain when they load it. So our, our terminology, again, is not using it or resisting it. It's loading. It's all about how much you load the tendon. So if you load it, so if it's your Achilles and you go up on your toes, that's loading it. Yeah. If you run on it, that's loading it. And if you load a tendon that's not working well, it will hurt. And it might hurt 1 out of 10. It might hurt 10 out of 10. But it, but it hurts. Now that is what we're trying to improve with treatment, isn't it? I mean, you want to run. So it's got to not hurt when you're running, and that's what we're after. So there's a couple of other things that give you the diagnosis of tendonitis, which sometimes don't get better with treatment, and you shouldn't be concerned about it. So palpation just means to touch. So again, if it's your Achilles, it's only just under the skin. It's very easy to stick your thumb on it, and somebody jumps off the bed, and, oh, Achilles tendonitis, that's dead easy. Now, unfortunately for a lot of people, that doesn't actually improve with treatment. I have tons and tons of patients who can run again, do whatever they need to do, but they can still lie down on the couch and you touch the spot and they're going, oh, it's not better. Well, no, it is. It is because a tendon's not there to be squeezed. That's not its job. A tendon's there to store energy, release energy. So if you're better when you exercise, you are better, right? Don't keep prodding it. Don't keep mess out, messing with it. Ignore it, okay? You are better. Now, if they all get better, that's great, but don't panic if it still hurts to touch it. Um, obviously, as I was saying before, if it's swollen and it's early swelling that's mainly related to fluid changes, that does get better. If you've left it a bit longer and the tendon collagen has become disrepaired and it's got little knobbly bits in it where there's damage to the collagen, that tendon might be knobbly forever. But if it doesn't hurt when you run, ignore it. And then the other thing that gives the diagnosis away is the pattern. So a tendonitis always behaves in a set way. So First thing in the morning, if anybody's had plantar fasciitis, hands up. First thing in the morning, absolute effing agony when you first get out of the bed, typically, okay? Now, then when you walk <clears throat> a couple of minutes, can be an hour, it reduces. It still hurts, but it reduces. It's better than it was first thing in the morning. Now, most tendonitis follows that same pattern, if it's in your legs, that is, certainly. It tends to warm up, so a lot of people actually start an exercise, like you might go out for a jog and you jog the first five minutes thinking, I'm not going to be able to carry on. And then it kind of eases up, so you carry on and then you think, well, it's not that bad. But that again suggests that you've got a tendonitis. We shouldn't be in pain when we start jogging, but we kind of accept it because most of our lives are in pain because we put the exercise in every day. But you shouldn't, is what I'm saying. And then after exercise, when your body cools down and you get stuck in the chair, and then it often comes on again. That's, that's another typical pattern. Now, obviously, if you've left it too long, and this has been going on for ages, it will then get to the bottom sort of level where it just hurts pretty much all the time, whatever you're doing. But tendonitis doesn't often become totally chronic where it doesn't vary. It's not like to be six out of 10 in the morning, six out of 10 at lunch, six out of 10 in the evening, six out of 10 when you go to bed. It doesn't stay static because it depends what you do to it to provoke it or to help it through the day. So it should always vary 
depending on what you're doing during the day, okay? Now, if you've got those things, you've pretty much got tendonitis. Luckily, most of the tendons that we've identified in the legs are only very superficially located just under the skin. So they're not that easy. For, for patients would normally come to me and say, it's there, and they stick, the, they stick the finger on the spot. That's where my problem is. Whereas if you've got another problem, like a joint problem, an arthritis or you know, something like that, you tend to be more vague. Or if it's a referred pain from your back or something like that, you tend to use your whole hand and go, it's kind of all right. So if somebody came and did this on the front of the knee, my first thought wouldn't be patellar tendonitis. But if they come and go, it's right there then it certainly would, it would be. So that's, that's the thing with tendonitis. It's relatively easy to recognise. So on the back of that, we don't really need to do many investigations. It's all, you know, God, we love them. Nice to have a scan, whether it's an MRI scan or an ultrasound scan. It confirms it, shows us a picture, and it can help patients to understand what's going on. It's not essential. You don't need it to make the diagnosis. The only time that I tend to refer for those tests are if the diagnosis isn't conclusive, so one of the things with an Achilles is if somebody had injured it um, as a one-off injury, so they'd gone out for a run, never had a problem before, slipped or twisted or done something a bit significant, you would want to rule out something like a partial tear of the tendon. A total rupture should be quite obvious, but a partial tear needs resting a lot, lot more than a tendonitis does. So if I'm unsure of the diagnosis, they might get a scan. The other patient that would get a scan is somebody that's been through the mill, they've done absolutely everything, they've been for various investigations before, they've seen physio after physio, they might have had needling of something, they might have had shockwave of this and that and the other, then we need, we need to get an up-to-date picture of what, what the hell's going on because that might guide what I would offer them. But for the majority of people, we get it early and we, we can recognise it with no other features then, they just need, need the treatment for that tendonitis. So, what do they get better with? So, go on, interact with me just a little bit. What rest. makes tendons better? Rest. Rest. <laughs> Come on, shout them out, don't be shy. Oh, yes. Hmm? So, rest and maybe a bit of exercise. Acupuncture. Loading. Codeine? Loading. Oh, loading, yeah. yeah. Not codeine. Yeah, right. Anything else? Shockwave. 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 Yeah, anything else? It's a massage. Massage, yeah, so I, I got them. Unfortunately, that's all wrong. So, <clears throat> none of those help your tendons to get better. So, if you've been, unfortunately, if you've been going pain physio, and all you get is something off that list, you might as well just chuck your money in the bin, unfortunately. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have a place, okay? But all those treatments, which are very, very common treatments, and we all try them, and at yeah, me as well, we all use them, they purely help you to modulate the pain that you're in now. So, if you have a massage, you will feel better. I think everybody in the room would say, I have a massage, I feel better. Is it making that tendon better? No. Take tablets, same thing. You do your stretches, same thing. You want to go on ice, same thing. You rest it, same thing. So how would you diagnose between a localised tear and a tendonitis? Well, if you're unsure, a scan. Right. Okay. You so for, for a localised tear, you're saying rest is the... Yes, is so yeah, mean. I'm purely talking about tendonitis yeah. now, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah so it's, it's understanding how would you recognise the difference? Of... So the history of the onset of the problem is usually different. A tendonitis comes on a bit innocuously. It comes on insidiously, gradually over time, and then it just interrupts your daily life more and more and more and more. With a, a tear, there's normally a one-off, not normally a big injury, but a minimal injury where a patient will come in and say, it started on the 14th of July, is that Iron Man Day? Anyway, uh, and it started on that time, and I did this. And is it very localised? It starts localised, but it depends what time they get to, to me or to somebody else, because unfortunately, as any, any pain becomes more chronic, you get smudging and referred pain. So you, what starts off, you might be able to put your finger on it, say it's there, by the time you get to see a professional, if it's a couple of months or more down the line, often you're saying, oh, it's kind of all around, and it's all around here. So it can be difficult. Okay, if in doubt, and you think that tear needs to be treated as a tear, you'd need to scan it. 
if it's a long way down the line and you think, well, actually, there's no point treating it like a turn now because it's, mm. it's, it's so long ago, it's not going to change what I do, then you would treat it like tendonitis anyway. But that's, again, that's on a case-by-case case okay. scenario. So don't go buying stuff from your Facebook feed that pops up saying you've been looking at foam rollers, spiky balls. Um, if you want to buy them for other reasons, by all means, um, don't go wasting your time on some sort of pen or zapping gun um, or anything like that. TENS machine, useful for pregnant ladies, well, pregnant ladies in labour, but that's, that's about it. So don't go spending all your money on these bits and bobs that you see and you think, oh, maybe it will just fix me. Because in all likelihood, it won't. Okay? So that's all doom and gloom. So on the flip side, this is a, a slide I took from a, another lecture that I did for, for physios. This is what we need to focus on. So the boxes, are, well, the, the, the circles in red are what is key for me to do with a patient, which might be you guys, let's say. So we need to educate you a bit like we're doing today. Let's tell you what the problem is, tell you how you can look after yourself. We need to change whatever it is you're doing that is aggravating your problem. And if you don't do that, it's likely that no other treatment will help. So that's the first one that's difficult. Luckily with us guys, you can still get on your bike, hopefully you can still swim. So there's things to do and areas to work on, even if we can't save blood. And then the last one is this loading program, this strength, what you might think of as just a strengthening program to get that tendon healthier. We've got to stimulate that, stimulate that tenocyte to start doing its job properly, okay? So that's what we're gonna look at there. Anything in the other boxes is not essential. And that's where all those treatments I said before were here. Altering this, yeah, it's that next step. If you've got a good physio or a good sports therapist or whatever, they look at the way you run, they look at your hips and blah, blah, blah. We might be able to do other stuff, but it's not essential. But it might be worthwhile. And then the sort of purple box is what I would think of doing for people who just don't get better. So that's your shockwave, things you can do with needles, operations, blah, blah, blah. But for the majority, if we get it right, we shouldn't need those things. So I'm not talking about those things. If you want to discuss anything like that, by all means, email me, come and see me, whatever you want. Now, there is no quick fix, okay? You don't get six pack abs from a tin, a bottle, and you don't get it from standing by the fence. You get it through hard, dedicated work on both your exercise and your diet. And it's kind of the same with tendonitis, okay? So you're gonna have to do the hard yards, but you can get yourself better, okay? Treatment, we need to pick it up early. So please don't bury your head in the sand, as I said before. Keep running, keep provoking it till you can't do anything because the journey back is going to take you a hell of a lot longer unfortunately okay we need to rest it but i never ever tell anybody they cannot do anything we can work ways out for you to keep exercising because i know i'd go totally nuts if i didn't okay so we might need to swap exercise from say running to cycling we might need to get you on the cross trainer if you can't even do that, we might need to change the way you use the cross trainer. There's always a way around these problems that can keep you active. So you certainly don't have to totally rest, particularly because total rest won't get any better. What will happen is you feel better, then you'll test it with a little jog. Oh shit, it's gone back again. Well, yeah, no shit. Um, because you've not changed anything, you've just rested it so it felt better. So exercise is still okay, but we've got to be very, very sensible with what we do. And you've got to listen to your coach, hopefully, and work with them on that, okay? And then, the most important bit which we're going to come on to is, is how do you strengthen it? How much do you do? Why should you do it? Etc. And I'm not talking about that stuff. That shockwave, by the way. So, this is a common sort of uh, diagram for how we think about tendon problems. If we can do the stuff that's in that manageable bit, but the other things that push us that little bit harder, like jumping a bit more or running for longer, if they're excessive, then we'll get a problem. Now, if you've got something like that, so they might still be exercising quite a lot, they're going to work, they're in no pain, but when they push it, they get problems, you just gotta rein them back a little bit, and then that's enough. The problem comes is when you let that get worse, this is you. Manageable includes nothing. And your whole ADLs means activities of daily living. It's everything you do. It's work, it's shopping, it's doing stuff with the kids. If all of that includes pain, it's all excessive and you need to change something. You need to rest it, change your working practices, change your social activities, whatever. Because if everything's excessive, no amount of strengthening will change it. More strengthening is more exercise, which is more pain. So we've got to get the balance right now. That is really, really difficult. And especially if people don't listen to you because then it's just utterly pointless. 
So we're going to make changes to your training program. We might need to change your working routines. Again, if you've got a job where you're on your feet a lot and it's, a, say, a heel pain or something, something's going to have to change. Otherwise, we face the, the probability that you might not get better. Um, when we're doing any activity, this could be your running, it could be your work, or it could be your strengthening exercises, we don't accept pain over 5 out of 10. So you score yourself, and if you're doing something and it regularly takes that pain in your tendon over a 4 or a 5 out of 10, it is doing you no good. But the good thing is, is that's how we judge what exercise you should be doing. We don't have to think about reps, sets, hours, days, blah, blah, blah. It's all simple. It's how much pain you get. This, um, this uh, diagram from a... He used to do a lot of, uh, sort of blogging and, and stuff on Twitter called Tom Goom, who who's calls himself the running physio. But that's just a little infographic thing which shows that basically anything from a zero to a five when you've got a tendonitis is acceptable. You don't have to only do things that don't hurt at all because then you'd be dead miserable and you'd be pretty much nothing you could do. But if you let it get past the five out of ten, it won't be productive. Okay? So it's, it's pretty simple. So... When we think about loading programs, it's all about putting weight on the tendon so that it's stimulated to get better. Now, the various way, you're probably, you're probably aware of a lot of this, but th this is the various ways that you can load a muscle or load a tendon. Isometrically means you put weight on it or, or resistance against it and, and there's no movement of the body part, the joint stays still. So for a calf exercise, you might go up onto your tiptoes and you hold it there. You could hold it at the top, you might hold it in the middle, it doesn't really matter, but it's still isometric. It doesn't have to be light, so there's a lot of thought that isometrics is easy. It doesn't have to be. You could put a barbell on with a shed load of kilos of weight on it. It doesn't have to be easy, but it's static. So the key with isometrics is they're static. Um, we would then move on to something like eccentrics, which is the lowering portion. So on the calf raise, again, it's the bit where you go down. It's that lowering against gravity, not the bit going up. That's the concentric phase of the... You know. Eccentrics came around because... Um, a Swedish doctor by the name of Alfredson had tendonitis. He wanted an operation. The orthopedic doctors wouldn't give him the operation. He said, the only way we're going to operate is if you go away and it snapped and then we'll fix it. So he went away and tried to snap it. By trying to snap it, he got better. And he got better because he put so much load through his tendon, it reacted and got healthier and stronger. He then replicated that with numerous amounts of subjects and they all seemed to do very well. So an eccentric loading protocol came out as being, yep, this is the thing to do. So about 10, 15 years ago, I took it, give it all my patients and all of them come back saying you've made me worse. Because he didn't have a severe tendinopathy. His only hurt when he went running. So it could stand him to bash it to death with his exercises because it never hurt him all day. Similarly, all of his studies that he did were on sports people. When you then overlay that to the general public, who are not used to being in pain, who are in pain most of the day because they stand at work all day, you give them that protocol and the majority come back worse because it's too much. So eccentrics are useful, but if you've gone to physio or anywhere and they said, oh, you've got to lower this, and you know, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. It can be, but not necessarily. <clears throat> and then your normal resistance exercises where you're moving both directions. That's concentric <coughs> and eccentric. Now that definitely works, just like any exercise would, but it needs to be heavy and it needs to be slow. So a lot of research now has come out showing it's, it's the time under tension that matters. So if you lift the weight slowly and lift as heavy as you can in both directions, you know, a good couple of seconds in each direction, that's what's beneficial. It's not just repping it out because you want to get it done and then get off. It's actually the time that you spend with tension on that tendon that really helps it. And then you would progress at the end maybe, you certainly wouldn't do this in the early days, to things that involve hopping, skipping, running, plyometrics, soft boxes, blah, blah, blah. So you, you're actually loading it very quickly, very sharply, very intensely. And you'd want to do that before you go back to sport, you know, whether it's football, running, whatever. You'd want to make sure the tendon was able to do that before you let a patient just go. But that's late stage. So some people, if you've got tendonitis, you might start at that stage. If your condition isn't so bad, you don't need to start at the beginning. You start wherever that pain score is less than a five out of 10. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm thinking with everybody. And the main thing to get across is it's not, 
a case of the heavier the better. You know, we're all driven to get better. And if we get a VO2 max set of five lots of three minutes, we try and go above VO2 max or give the last one a bit more. We do six lots. The chance of getting more benefit from that is outweighed by the risk of injury and making yourself worse. So don't be that typical type A neurotic personality that wants to do more, <coughs> to do more is better. Enough <coughs> is enough, okay? So not the more the better. So the main sort of key points is, we would start you where you need to be along that. I'd be thinking, right, how bad is this? How quick is it re to react and become painful? And I would start you hopefully at the right sort of level for you. We'd adjust your working practices or your social activities if needed. We'd stop you running or whatever if needed. And then we'd mix that together. And that's still going to take three months. Sort of minimum. Now, that doesn't mean you won't be feeling better before three months. But your tendon won't be better. Because for that tendon cell to change the collagen and rebuild the tendon, it's, it's like a 12-week process. There's no quick healers. There's nobody that out, you know, outweighs that. It does take three months. So when we're looking at being patient and doing what we're told, we've really got to stick with it. Now, your pain should hopefully feel better before that because you're doing the right things to get your pain under control. But the tendon won't be that much healthier until sort of three months. And we said most of that. So, so some rough examples so you can get an idea. If you had patella tendonitis, which is just below your kneecap, you could do, this was a heavy resistance program that they did a mixture of leg press, squats, hack squats. And what's a very useful exercise, which doesn't really need much equipment, is the top left A, which is a decline squat. So if you um, put your feet into plantar flexion, pointed downwards, as you do a squat, most of your body weight is falling forwards, which is on the kneecap, which is on the, on the tendon. If you do a normal squat on your heels, a lot of it is taken by the posterior chain muscles, the, the, the glutes, the hamstrings. So you, you will still get benefit, particularly if you go heavy. But if you want to isolate the tendon, then a, a downward angle of about 30 degrees, doesn't really matter too much, but about 30 degrees seems to work really, really well. But again, you only do it, whichever of them you do, until about five out of 10. Same thing, okay? If it was your Achilles or even your plantar fascia, you might want to think of these sorts of exercises. You've got like a bent knee calf raise, you've got a calf raise on a leg press, you've got your traditional sort of calf raise. You know, where, where Achilles and plantar fascia are concerned, all those muscles connected to that in your calf can do is point your foot down. There's, there's not much else they can do, so you can vary it a little bit, but it's pretty simple, okay? This exercise, you might not have come across. This one's specific for plantar fasciopathy or fasciitis, and it's the same calf raise, either two-legged or one-legged, but we're engaging the plantar fascia more by flexing the toes upwards, so the towel is just keeping the toes bent up as your heel goes up and down. And that extra tug on the plantar fascia can stimulate a bit more activity there, which is what, is what we're after if we're trying to get it better. So that, that one was actually studied not long ago, and that, that seemed to work really well. Um, hamstrings, if you've got insertional tendinopathy, so if you've got hamstring tendinitis right up the top, which is where most people get it, you don't really get tendinitis so much at the bottom. It's possible, but you, you don't see much. It's more up at the top then these are a range of exercises that you could do, okay? Starting from something that's not very functional, like the gym ball, because you're lying down, and moving to like the king of all hamstring exercises, which is the Nordic curl, where you come up and down in a prone position. But it's, for me, it's near impossible, but you yeah, can have a go at that. And then, for those that are prone to this problem, or who have it, or are recovering from it, again, let's do something proactively to try and make sure it doesn't ruin the rest of your season. And this is the last point, really, is that for athletes, if you're during the season where you're, you're active and you're constantly using these tendons and wearing them down a little bit, you would probably go for those isometrics where you're static. But you can put as much weight on as you like, but we're not going up, down, up, down, up, down, because you're doing enough of that kind of through your training week. And that works well. If you're off season and you want to prevent it occurring next season or you're recovering, you would go for the heavy strength resistance work and you would probably do some uh, SSC, which is like hopping drills and, and stuff like that, depending on where the problem is. And th that could be done three times a week. Now, for my non-athletes, I just tend to not involve the weights, but for them to stimulate the tendon, they've just got to do hundreds of repetitions. You guys don't necessarily need to do hundreds of repetitions if you get down the gym and lift heavy. But lift heavy, only up to five out of 10, okay? If you've got any personal issues you want me to look at, very welcome to. 
Um, if you've got a question you want to grab me now or during the swim or after, by all means come and I'll give you as much advice as I can. And um, hopefully you've taken enough from that and I've not confused you too much. It's relatively simple. Um, we shouldn't get confused with all these other guff that people try and sell us, basically. Has anybody got a quick question before we head to the swim? Do you know if you haven't got any issues, if you don't believe you've got any issues, get out. <laughs> um, something like plyometrics, is it, is it advisable to do 20 minutes, half an hour per week, or more or less, or so, it, what, what do you do to prevent it from coming in in the first place? So that, that same sort of stuff that we've said, yeah. but if you're naturally at lower risk, what you've got to do if you're going to introduce plyometrics, which is basically that stretch shortening cycle magnified, is you'd have to start out with small yeah. bits and then build it and build it and build it. Like with plyometrics, because it's constant effort with high load, you're not doing many repetitions, you keep it to just a few exercises and it might take you 20 minutes maximum, or, you know, 30 minutes. You're not, it's not like a long exercise session, you're not getting much of a, a sweaty fix on. It's, it's very short and sharp. It will help protect your tendons if you're at that level that you can cope with it. Um, but also, it's, it's high risk. Uh, of all the exercises you can do, it's at the higher risk, so you've got to be more careful. But there are definitely performance benefits. You will improve the stiffness of your tendons through doing it, which should make you running more economical. It should make you more powerful. So there are definite benefits. Um, you know, the benefits wear off a bit if you're Ironman, because yeah, you do need some of that, and economy of movement is definitely worth having. But you've got to weigh up. If you're doing a 20-hour training week, do you really want to be loading it fast and hard at the same time? So it's all about balance. But yeah, certainly you can do them, but be cautious. Appreciate some background.